Uh, my name is Matt Tori. I'm with a company called Innovatus Imaging. Um, we are uh, an ultrasound imaging company. We also do MRI <laughs> and uh, uh, CR printer service. Uh, but what we're talking about this morning is ultrasound. Uh, we do ultrasound probe repair. We also manufacture specialty ultrasound probes and ultrasound arrays. Uh, we do have an FDA registered uh, facility in Denver, Colorado for that purpose. And our repair facility is in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, our CEO, Dennis Wolf, he's actually sitting in the back in the, in the teal shirt. Uh, Dennis has a class tomorrow. He's actually, he's our founder. He's, his, uh, his tenure at ultrasound goes back to the late 70s. Uh, but uh, he's giving a talk tomorrow at 945. It's getting schooled in ultrasound. I see a lot of ultrasound students in here. Um, I strongly encourage you to go to Dennis' class tomorrow at 945. Um, it is targeting a lot of you. Um, as, as well as some of the service personnel as well. But it's at 9.45 tomorrow, so please plan on attending that. Um, this class here, this class was kind of born out of um, me being a service engineer. I started as a service engineer in 1986 with a company called Acuson. I don't know how many of you remember that. Um, Acuson, the greatest ultrasound company and machine ever. Um, I started with them, and uh, I immediately became absolutely in love with the model. I love ultrasound. I, I, I call myself an ultrasound nerd. Um, I, I, I still, to this day, spend morning and night just reading about all this stuff and learning more about it. And I became a really good service engineer. I used to read service manuals, <clears throat> excuse me, as a hobby. And so I knew every machine out there. Um, but the one thing I didn't know is I'd walk into a room and a sonographer would say, my image is mushy, my image is grainy, my image is yucky. I don't know what this means. I, I, I can't help you. What's, what's broken would be my question. And so then I started picking up probes. So every time I'd walk into a room, the first thing I'd do is my shirt would come up, I'd slap a probe on, and I'd start playing with buttons. What does this button do? If I hit this button, what happens to the image? And I got really good at it. I started, um, and then I started scanning friends. Friends would come over to the house. You know, I'm, I'm you know, six months old, you know, a year exam. Um, I wouldn't trust myself to do a diagnostic exam, but I, I got pretty good at it. And so I ended up marrying a and so she and I were talking about it. Um, she does high risk perinatology now. <clears throat> and so she and I got talking about it. She said, well, let's a class. This would be fun. And so we wrote this basic application class for people who are getting in front of sonographers, people who are getting in front of machines who want to know the language of the sonographer and, and when I push this button, what happens? And so the, what I like to say is this takes a really good service engineer, no matter how good of a service engineer you are. If you understand this material, it will make you a great service engineer. You're going to be able to go in, the sonographer is going to start talking to you, and you're going to understand what he or she is saying. And you're going to be able to help. Let's get started. So why do we need to know this stuff? Well, um, it's to instill customer confidence. So if you can go in and the sonographer starts telling you about a problem they're having, you lift up your shirt or you pull down your shirt collar and you start scanning, you say, okay, I know what you're talking about. They're going to look at you and like, okay, you get, you're, you're here to fix my problem. Um, the, the ability to differentiate between an applications issue and a malfunction. Throughout my quarter century of service, um, there were so many times where I would go in for a service call and they'd report, hey, my machine's broken, it's not doing X or Y. And I'd go in and be like, oh, it's not broken. Um, you, know, you have a noise problem or there's something not adjusted correctly, your monitor's not adjusted correctly. So a lot of the reported malfunctions, weren't malfunctions, they were just something they had to adjust on the system. Um, the ability to set, uh, test the system clinically. Um, I used to carry around a tissue mimicking phantom. As a service engineer, I had to have one. Um, but I was my own fan, and so I didn't really bring my phantom in any place. And anytime anybody had an image issue, I just tripped him up. Okay, I got it, I see what you're talking about. Um, by the way, all the images that you'll see throughout here, except for the fetal images, um, and there's a couple images with pathology, uh, those are all me. And so what I did was, as I wrote this class, I just got in front of the machine and I just started doing a screen grab. So this over here is, uh, is me. Um, so you'll understand the language of the sonographer technologist. How many in here are sonography students? I think I see a lot. Okay, I see much better. Raise your hand. I'm, oh, I'm oh you're the teacher. Oh, so you're going to critique me? No. <laughs> <laughs> now I can't lie to you because I got an actual expert in the room. <laughs> Actually, the last time I did this, um, I actually had a, a registered sonographer in the class, and I'm like, oh my god, 
Is this on the and, and, and at the end, she's like, you were 99% there. So, and, <laughs> I, I, I want to grade after this is so, over. So in, this, this is a differentiator between a good service engineer and a great one. This, this is the soft skill that will complement your hard tech. So let's start with system display settings. Um, what I did was uh, over here, I put two different display settings. Um, one is incorrect, obviously, one is correct. Um, before you start looking at an image, you want to make sure your main display is, is adjusted correctly. If it's not, everything else doesn't matter. And so if you look over here, this, this top image here, I made the background way too bright and I made the image way too contrast. And you can see this grayscale bar over here. You can see this bottom step very, very discreetly. Down here, you can see the bottom step just kind of fades into the background. So this image here is adjusted correctly. And so <clears throat> before you adjust any settings on an ultrasound machine, talk to the sonographer. Some sonographers like their images adjusted in a certain way. So don't just go in there and say, I'm, hey, I know what I'm doing and start playing with the machine um, to do your hand slides. Um, proper monitor settings is a requirement for ACR. And so if you are American College of Radiology accredited or ultrasound in the department that you're in, um, you are required to check your monitor display settings to make sure it is set up correctly. So what you're seeing here, by the way, is for those of you who are not sonography students, um, this is my liver on here, this is my kidney, and my diaphragm down here. Um, I have what's called kind of a glass body. I, I image very, very well. In fact, in it was the early 90s, Accusant actually used that, not that exact <coughs> image, but that um, that window uh, in an ad for their, their 128 dash. A few, a few scotches later, I don't know if they can do that or not, but it still looks pretty darn good. So, pop quiz. Will, adjusted, will adjusting the system's main display settings have any effect on the image presentation on PAC system? How many say it will affect the PAC? One. Okay. How many say it will not affect the PAC? Okay. How many are just here just take us? <laughs> <laughs> My coworkers in the back. Um, why do you think it will change it? Because if you capture an image that is over enhanced or um, over contrast, you cannot adjust that once you take the image and pack. You can adjust monitor brightness, but as far as taking the image and changing the contrast with it, and it's, it's very difficult to do that for the overall game. Yeah, we're, we're getting in the ballpark. What happens is, if my if my monitor is adjusted like this, my main I, I say monitor because I'm I'm old and I started in the days of we had actual monitors, so we had CRTs on the machine. Now we have LCDs and LEDs. But if your main display is adjusted incorrectly, say it's adjusted like this, what's going to happen is the sonographer is going to say ah, and they're going to turn down their gain because it's way too bright, and so that'll cause the images that go over the pack system to be very very dark. Conversely, this really dark image. The sonographer is going to say, oh, I, I got nothing out of this image. I got I to gotta get it on top. And so they're going to crank up the game. They're going to change it. And it's going to make the images going over to packs very bright. So there's a, an indirect correlation. So let's talk just real quickly about different scan head types. So these are the three main scan head types. Um, we have a linear, uh, we have a curvilinear, and we have a sector. If you take this linear, the only difference between these two is this is a linear array. If we took that array and basically we bent it, um, and actually, um, you can, if any of you get an opportunity to visit our Denver facility and actually see us do it, um, in Denver, where we make, we actually manufacture transducer arrays, um, I've watched technicians as they bend that array around a mold to get it to fit that curved linear shape. We, we make specially machined molds for different types of transducers, and you can watch them, and these, and these arrays are virtually paper thin, and of course, they're made out of a ceramic-like material, so they're very fragile, and so they're trying to bend that. Oh, I hope it doesn't snap. And so that's all that is. That's a linear array. It's just bent. And what it does is it gives you the advantage of this fairly wide view, but it gives you a really wide far field. So when you're doing abdominal work, or abdominal work, or special work, it gives you that nice far field. And then the sector probe over here, you see the image goes into this pinpoint here. Um, that's mainly used for cardiac. Um, and that allows you to get into tight spaces like intercostal ones or if you can ribs. Um, if you uh, if you hit bone with ultrasound, 
um, it causes the sound to scatter, so it destroys your image. And so for cardiac work, you want to get in between the bone or underneath the bone. Um, and so you need to probe that. And if you guys have any questions as we go through this, please feel free to ask. Um, let's talk a little bit about transducer construction. This, and um, the, the talk um, my, my colleague Dennis Wolf is doing tomorrow um, is, is predicated on uh, visits that we have from OU, the University of Oklahoma. Um, Dennis brings in um, fourth year sonography students from OU um, to show them hey, this is how these things are built. The, you know, the, these are the things that can go along with this. Because before that, it's just kind of a widget that we use for work. And so he kind of goes through and talks about how they're constructed and how to care for them. And so a, 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 a <laughs> ultrasound transducer is a class two medical device, and it's very sophisticated. Um, it, it is not a widget. Um, there's a lot of science that goes into these things, a very precise science. Um, our lab in Denver, Colorado is FDA registered, and it's essentially an acoustic lab. And so we do a lot of acoustic. And so let's start with the top of the probe, the lens. Um, the lens is not a barrier between the array and the rest of the probe. Um, the lens actually does something just like you know, eyeglasses here. This is an optical lens. Um, the lens on the transducer is an acoustic lens. It does help focus the mechanical energy coming out of the probe. And so its job is to focus the um, ultrasound beam. It could be a single or multiple layers. And it must be ISO 10993 compliant. Does anybody know what that means? Got a lot of work to do. Um, ISO 10993, it's an international standard. Um, it's a standard for biocompatibility. Uh, um, the materials must be tested to ensure that there is no harmful interaction between that material and the And that's especially important. We do a lot of TE work as well. And it's especially important because now you're inserting probes into the body. So you want to make sure those materials are compatible uh, with you. Um, we have something called matching layers, and now we're getting into kind of the nerd stuff. Um, we're not going to spend too much time here, but basically these matching layers is there is an impedance mismatch between the transducer and the human body. And so these matching layers, what they do is they closely, more closely couple um, the impedance between the transducer and the body to ensure the energy transmission to the body is more efficient. And then we have the array. The array is really the heart and soul of the transducer. Um, down here, we actually have a grown up picture of an array. There's a human hair um, run across um, an array. Um, in, in our booth, um, if you folks get an opportunity to come by, we're at booth 500 501. We actually have a transducer array that we manufacture in Denver. And what I did was I had our, um, our engineers stop the, the manufacturing process halfway through and we uh, magnified 250 times so you can see what the substrate looks like. And what the actual elements look like under that magnification. It's really cool. So stop by our booth. Um, the, the space in between these crystals, by the way, is about one fifth or 20% of the width of the human hair. So we're without the microscopic level here. Then we have some shielding um, for noise. And then we have something of, kind of called a uh, backing material. It's basically kind of a backboard for the sound to make sure it directs the sound into the body. And we have a flex circuit below there. Um, and this is just basically the, the signal paths between the array and the main cable. Uh, we have something called an interconnect. Um, then we have the miniature coaxes. This is really important here. The miniature coaxes are the cable that go down through here into the machine. <clears throat> These cables have 64, 128, sometimes more cables. Um, coaxial cables. So everybody here, you know, they've, they've seen a coaxial cable for cable TV or satellite or whatever, those, those thick black cables that carry video and audio to your, your television or your satellite box. Well, they, imagine 128 of those inside, inside this. There's 128 or more inside here, and it's got to be flexible. Um, when, I, when I started an ultrasound back in 86, uh, these cables were about three quarters of an inch around, and basically it was like bending rebar. And sonographers used to drape it over their neck because these things were so heavy and so inflexible. Uh, we've come a long way. We actually manufacture cables in Tulsa, Oklahoma for our various repairs. <clears throat> very, very complex. Um, image resolution. Here's where we start getting into understanding what sonographers are talking about. Sonographers will talk about resolution. Um, well, okay, you're talking about resolution. What exactly do you mean? There's all kinds of different resolutions. And so the first one is lateral resolution. So if you look at 
Um, how many of you have ever used a fan or seen a fan? Okay, cool. So this is a, a, a diagram, basically, of a, a tissue mimicking fan. And you see all these dots, and they're vertical, they're horizontal, and then you have these circular structures. Lateral resolution is how good, of a, how good is my machine, how good is that probe, how good is the system of devices in distinguishing between two objects that are very, very close together. If they're so close together, can the system still tell that it's two distinct objects or do they merge into one? And so that's your, your lateral resolution. <clears throat> Our actual resolution is the opposite. It's 90 degrees out. So if I have two objects that are tiny and they're on top of each other, they're really close together in the axial plane, can my machine and my probe distinguish between these, these two objects? And then we have an elevational, which is now we have, we have our, our axial, we have our lateral, our elevational is our back and forth. So if I have two objects beside each other, how well can my machine and my probe working together distinguish between those two objects? Then we have contrast resolution. These objects over here, these are simulated cysts and they have different densities. <clears throat> the, the contrast resolution is how good is my machine and my probe at distinguishing objects of very, very similar densities. So if you have a mass in the body and the mass has a very similar density of the surrounding tissue, the healthy tissue, can that machine distinguish between those two objects? <clears throat> and then we have temporal. Uh, temporal is the ability to distinguish changes over time. Where temporal resolution comes in is when you're looking at moving objects, like the harder you're watching blood. So transducer designations, this, this is where things get a little confusing. Um, I get this question a lot, is you know, what do those numbers and letters on a transducer mean? Um, the answer is sometimes they mean what the transducer is and what it does, and sometimes they're utterly meaningless. Um, they, they don't mean anything, it's just something the manufacturer puts on there to distinguish between one probe and that. But some of them, the, the, the naming structure actually means something. So if we look at the GAC, it's a very common, it's an endovaginal probe for general electric. So the E means end of cavity, the C means it's a convex format, and the 8 is the center frequency of the transducer. If we go down to a Phillips, a Phillips C, a 5 2, the C is convex, and it's a 5 to 2 megahertz probe. And same with the Siemens, Siemens 4C1, it's, it's a 4, 4 to 1 megahertz, it's a convex. Um, the GE ML6-15 means it's a matrix array. Um, how many of you know what a matrix array is? Um, traditional ultrasound transitions, the, the crystal array um, is, is just diced in a single format, so all the elements are parallel to each other. Um, in a matrix array, what happens is we dice this way, and then we dice horizontally, and so we make a matrix. And so traditional transducers can have 64, 128, 192 elements. Uh, these matrix array can have 2,500 elements or more. Let's talk about imaging modes. Um, when I first started in ultrasound, this is all I had. I had B-mode imaging. Um, this is actually my son here. Uh, he, is, he is now 12. With, with me being an ultrasound and my wife being an ultrasound, my kids were the most imaged children ever. We had like five photo albums before they were even born. <laughs> Living proof that ultrasound, when used properly, is not harmful. They're, they're both very bright children, they think after my wife. So B mode, um, what B mode is, B mode stands for brightness mode. And so with B mode, all we're doing is we're sending in lines of ultrasound and we're bouncing them off objects. And so when you think about it, when, when I take this probe and we'll, we'll switch over here, here's where it gets going. I had to smuggle some gel on the plane. Uh -oh. I almost forgot my wife brought home this giant bag of gel. And so, actually, you can see this. And so this is BMO. And so what you see in the, the upper right corner there, that's my gallbladder. And we're seeing my liver in that big white structure. And that's my diaphragm. And if I go over here, I'm gassing this morning. Yeah, I'm trying to get my kidney. There's my kidney. And so all I'm doing is I'm sending lines of ultrasound into the body. And I know. I know the amplitude of the lines coming out of here. I know how much sound I'm putting out. The computer knows that, the computer's set up to do that. 
What I don't know is what's coming back. And so if I send out, and we'll use a round number, an amplitude of say 10, this line of ultrasound is a 10, all of them And I bounce it off objects within my body, some of them are gonna come back stronger and weaker depending on what they're hitting. And then the computer says, well, I send out a 10, I only got back a zero, so there must not be much there. I'm gonna make that black. Or I send out a 10, I got back a nine, I'm gonna make that bright white. And so that's how we make these images. We just keep sending out lines and we measure the amplitude of the lines coming back and we say, okay, this object's fence and this one's not. So that is B-mode imaging. And so stronger intensities, we have brighter pixels and weaker intensities, we have darker pixels. And so if you look over here, there's my boy. And so this is his uh, forehead here, his cranial bone. This is his brain, it has since developed, although he's a teenager now, so <laughs> I, I, I think he's regressing. And this is just amniotic fluid. <laughs> Um, 3D, 4D, blind. What's that? They're all in that beautiful baby. He's trying to get to the nose. He doesn't always work out that well, way. Well, my, my wife is a high risk perinatologist now. She, she sends me, uh, she's not a perinatologist, she works for a perinatologist. Yeah. She sends me images probably once a week. Oh, this is beautiful baby. Yeah. And the, the technology today is absolutely amazing. So 3D, um, 4D volume imaging has been around for a while, but it's, it's really come a long way. It's amazing today. Um, <clears throat> basically, what we do is through either a mechanical probe, uh, where we take an array in an oil bath, and we sweep the, we basically sweep through the body, we interrogate it, or um, we do have solid state 3D, 4D probes as well. Um, basically, we electronically sweep through the body, but we just sweep through and we reconstruct. And so this 3D, 4D volume imaging, it started out with babies and it makes really pretty baby pictures. Um, but this down here is actually a, I believe it's a mitral valve. This is not a mitral valve, right? Um, but it's, it's used a lot in cardiac. Uh, they're using it in urology applications. <coughs> so it, it's come a long way. And it's, it's just phenomenal technology. Um, M load imaging. M load stands for motion. Um, all we're doing is looking for motion. So if we look here, um, this is my heart, and you can see this white line down here. And what I did is I dropped that line down um, through my mitral valve. And I said, and so I just told the machine, you know, just tell me what's going on here. And what it does is it just shows me the motion all along that axis. So this is my chest wall, and this is actually this is the end of the image here, and this is my valve motion right here. And so people a lot smarter than me can look at this and determine whether there's any kind of anomaly going on with that valve. Um, we can also use it to look at heart wall motion. And so people who have um, heart conditions, who have heart attacks, <coughs> um, you can put that on the, on the heart wall and you know, people who are degree um, can actually see if there's a change in the, in the type of motion you're getting on the heart wall. Then we have Doppler mode. Um, how many have gotten a speeding ticket? How many have gotten two? How many have gotten three? So, so that, that's what Doppler is. Um, all Doppler is is you, you go down the street and the police officer has his or her radar gun and they fire it at you. They know what frequency they're firing at you. And a frequency comes back. And if that frequency is higher, they know you're compressing that way. So they know you're speeding and they know how much. And that gun will calculate how fast you go. We do the same thing with ultrasound. What we do is we fire a beam into a blood vessel and we bounce that beam off red blood cells and we can tell what direction they're going in and we can also tell um, how fast they're going. And so all I'm doing here is just firing lines of sound. You're not seeing real blood. I can paint this pink, purple, polka dots. It doesn't matter. Um, we just we choose because it's it's what we're expecting to see is um, you know, blue is typically Venus and red is typically arterial, but it doesn't matter. I can make whatever color I want. And so when when this first came out, this came out a while ago, but I was doing. Uh, um, when I was at Accusign, we just started putting this on machines as an upgrade. It was this forklift upgrade with a giant crate, with tons of boards and wires and all this stuff. And initially, we called it Doppler for Dummies uh, because pulse wave Doppler was very complex. 
and harder to read, while the color Doppler is very easy to read. And so we have all these different Doppler modes. We have pulse wave Doppler, continuous wave Doppler. Ted, can you bring up pulse wave over here, please? And so what Ted is doing here is he's doing something <laughs> called pulse wave. And so this is the peak, the peak systolic, and this is diastolic here. And what we look for for a nice clear artery is we want to see it cleared out underneath here. So we don't have what's called spectral broadening. That is a relatively healthy middle age man. Relatively. Good for your years. Um, we also have a continuous wave Doppler. Continuous wave Doppler is mainly used in cardiac applications. So rather than pulsing, we're constantly sending out a beat. And then we have, of course, uh, color Doppler, which I demonstrated. And typically we have BART, blue away from the transducer, red towards the transducer, generally. Again, this is just a computer overlay. The computer saying, this is what I'm seeing. I'm going to paint it this color, but it can be any color. Um, and then we have something called power or energy Doppler. Power Doppler is awesome. Um, it's great for looking at low flow, but it does not give you directional or flow velocities. It just basically says, hey, there's flow present. So, for example, if you have um, if you have a male with testicular torsion, you don't care what direction it's going in. Do I have flow or do I not? Or you, if you have an elderly person and you're looking at their extremities, um, you're looking down here in their lower legs, do they have flow or do they not? And the good thing about power or energy Doppler, it is super, super sensitive. It can pick up flows or standard color Doppler not, but it just doesn't give you all the information. But because it is sensitive, you can't move. And so if you have a patient who can't sit still, can't stop breathing while you're doing it, uh, power Doppler is useless because any slight motion, the Doppler will pick up. And we have this really cool thing here called Doppler tissue imaging or velocity. Basically what we do is we fire Doppler at the heart and look at the heart wall. And like ENMO that we showed you earlier, um, the DTI, the Doppler tissue imaging, it can actually look at anomalies in the heart wall motion using Doppler instead of standard. It's very cool. Um, Doppler aliasing. When I was a service engineer, I got so many service calls on this. There's something wrong with my Doppler. Um, and we see it in color a lot. And basically, if you look, if you look at this, this number here, basically, and I am not going to turn you into sonographers. You need to go to school for years for this. This is just ele the elements of this, and this is just one on one stuff. Um, and the last thing you want to do is go into a sonographer and say, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Uh, because you'll be shown the door very, very quickly. This is more for your knowledge. And maybe make a slight adjustment when you're not looking. Because um, I have had to fix this many times. But if you look over here, this number here, 0.3, basically the machine is set up to read velocities at a maximum of 0.3 um, centimeters um, per second. Um, well, my velocity is higher than my carotid, where I'm measuring here. And so what's happening is the machine is actually clipping it off. It's called aliasing. And you can see the signal wrapping around. So the top of this signal is actually coming up through the bottom. That's called alias. It's very common, and there's nothing wrong with the machine. It's just an adjustment. Um, we can also see aliasing in color. This over here, can you keep up across? Much easier if you just scan than just scan. We should have thought of this earlier. Although my liver is pretty good today. By far. Is it, is it Isha? Yeah. Isha? Now you're good. All right, let's hear it for you. So let's see, let's see good flow and then, then let's see some aliases. Okay? Nice. Yeah. And I said, turn your scale now. I see a screwing in a light bulb joke coming up. Really. <laughs> okay, so now we have really good flow. Now, each is going to turn down the scale. Okay, 
Okay, so we have good growth. It's, I'm assuming this is this gain. Yes. There we go. PRF. Overall. Okay, perfect. If you can just bring down the, the PRF or the scale. No, we want to the game. There we go. There we go. Perfect. Okay. So now we see different colors. So now the machine is saying, "Hey, I got colors going in different directions." Well, is there something wrong with Ted? Did we just kill Ted. Um, no, we we haven't killed Ted. At least not yet. Um, what what happened was is we changed our scale to a point where it's too low, and so that color wrap or that wrap around that we saw on this previous slide. We're now getting that wrap around in color. You see the scale here, well, we've exceeded this number, and so we're wrapping around. And what, what the color does, the color says, hey, I'm all going, you know, red's going in this direction, blue's going in this direction. In your carotid artery, you do not want two directions. That's bad, because that means the blood is hitting something and circling around. It's hitting a big piece of plaque, a white bit of it. And so this here is not a malfunction. Um, this image of myself, um, I am not dying. I do not have that much plaque in my artery. I have a tiny bit. Um, but this is just a system to test. So this, this is the term that you will hear is gains. Thank you, Okay, so let, let's talk a little bit about applications and presets. We've been messing around with the machine a little bit, making some adjustments. An application or a preset is something that's pre-programmed into a machine for a particular body part and a particular body type and a particular probe. Um, there's a lot that goes into this. Um, if, like, for example, but, you know, Ted just had the linear probe. That is a vascular probe. Um, let's look at the abdominal probe that I was using earlier. So the abdominal probe. Um, I'm middle-aged male. I'm, I'm 5'10 and currently 184 pounds. And so I'm going to set up the machine for my body habits. And I'm an easy scan. Um, what happens if now we get a gentleman who comes through the door who is 5'10", but he's 360 pounds. Um, are we going to use the same settings on the machine to scan this individual? We can't. It's not going to work. And so we have to tune the machine for different body types, different body parts, and different body, um, or different pros. And these all go into your presets or your applications. Um, I, I use the term interchangeably because the manufacturers and there can be between 30 and 50 variables that go into each individual preset. Um, it takes a very, very long time to do this. When the manufacturers, GE, Philips, Siemens, Toshiba, you know, Sonosite, whoever, when they come in and they sell you a machine, an application specialist will show up and they will spend a couple of days with you tuning that machine for you um, because everybody has their own image presentation. Um, my wife and I argue about image presentation all the time. Um, she likes her images very smooth. I like my images very contrast. I like a lot of pop to my images. Neither one is wrong. Well, actually, she's wrong. But <laughs> actually, she's got she, she has the credentials, so she's actually right. Um, but they're, they're actually, neither one is wrong. Um, you, it, it's like saying, what shade of blue is best? I don't know. I kind of like them all. Um, you can have images that look dramatically different, but they're still good. They're still diagnostic. <laughs> People have their preferences, how they want to see images. And so you as a service engineer, how many people are wrenching on machines today? Cool. Um, if you're super, superman or superwoman, you have a machine that goes down, say a hard drive crashes, and you go in and you fix that machine in an hour, and it's up and running, and you think, God, I nailed that. I, I got it up in an hour. They're thrilled. You don't put their presets back, they're not going to use the machine. They will not use it, I guarantee it, um, because you didn't restore their presets. If you're a service engineer, and, and I did this for a very long time, back up early, back up often, and back up your backups. Um, it, it takes, um, I used to do this for, uh, for, uh, for sites. Um, I used to go in and do applications, and I would sit there for a day or two, and I would scan. We would scan all day, and we would tune those machines, and then we would save them. Um, it's very painstaking, um, and Unless you've been doing this for a very long time, you can't do it yourself. Um, you, you, you'd have to call in the manufacturer. And so when you're working on these machines, or if you have these machines, encourage backups all the time. Because these machines, they, they can change over time. 
people make adjustments, the manufacturer adds options, things like that. If you don't back up, um, you're only halfway home with that machine breaks and you get up and running. So let's talk about some of the some of the different settings um, within a machine. The first one is power or acoustic output. Um, acoustic output is how much mechanical energy am I putting out of this transducer? Um, acoustic output is critical. When we do probe repairs, when we develop probe repair processes, when we develop an array uh, where we build our arrays in Denver, we do acoustic testing. We need to know how much power is coming out of that array. Um, the FDA is very clear about how much power you can put out into the human body. And so power output uh, is, is mission critical. Um, every ultrasound system has, it, it has breaks. Um, you cannot set an ultrasound machine up to put up too much power in your body. And so systems register, they, they, um, they display power either in decibels or in percentages. On this particular machine, we have a GE machine over here. Where are the I'm not wearing my glasses. Where are we? Oh, power up. Okay. We're at we're at 70 some percent. Um, I did an experiment, in fact, I can show you. Um, what happens is you can adjust how much power the machine's putting out. And what happens is Power is your transmit. Well, and then you also have a receive. So this is, think of this as a loudspeaker, a microphone. We're taking one form of energy and turning it into another. So if I'm at 100% and go a little deeper, to, go down to 160, 180. So I'm going to go down, and you can see my heart right here. And so basically, I'm going up. Through my chest cavity, and I'm looking at the bottom of my heart from what's called the subcostals underneath my ribs. So take a look at that, and we're at 100% power here. Take that down to 25. Okay, so we're at what? 44. Okay, we're at 24%. Not bad. We just cut our power by 75%, and I'm still getting a fairly diagnostic image. If you can turn up the game a little bit. Yeah. And, and we have a portable machine. The portable machines today are really good. They still haven't gotten to the point where they can overtake a mainframe. The mainframes are, are much better. But at 24% power, I can still see my heart. I can still see my diaphragm really well. And so what happens is, is that as I decrease my power, what the machine is doing is the machine is saying, hey, wait a minute. I'm not getting enough back. I've got to turn up my amplifiers. And so that's the other side of this is gain. And so as I decrease my output power, the system starts listening harder. So the receivers inside the machine, these very specialized amplifiers, they start listening harder. They turn up in order to make sure that the image presentation stays the same. Can you have a difference on if you were doing like a muscle scale level type scan? Would you have to change the power based on the curve of the drum or not? Does that have no, no, we'll, we'll actually hit the frame machine in a moment, but the, the only time I really play with power, I, I, I've always loved power, and, and most people, most photographers do, they're going to leave it at zero because zero is safe. Um, a lot of machines, I don't know if they still do, but they used to have what was called a fetal setting. When you hit fetal setting, it cut the power in half. Um, on the old AccuSigns, you hit fetal exam, and the power would go to minus three decibels, which means you're cutting your power in half. And so, you know, we always want to use uh, the, the principle of Alara, as low as reasonably achievable. So if you get a good diagnostic image, especially on a baby, um, it, with 50% with power, why do you need 100% power? And so it's, it's prudent to go with a lower power, especially when you're going to keep it. But like small parts, if you're doing a, you know, an adult thyroid or, you know, a deep, a, you know, especially like a deep abdominal, you know, that, that, Fictitious 360 pound gentleman that may come through that door. Um, I'm, I'm going to want to leave that at 100% power. I'm going to need everything I've got. So these two images here. Um, this is my thyroid here. If you look here, this is my thyroid, my trachea. This is my common parotid here, the circular object. So same exact images. I didn't change anything on the machine other than my uh, my game. Um, TGC and LGC, these little knobs that you see, looks like a stereo equalizer on every ultrasound machine. Everyone has it. Um, all they do is they allow you to adjust gain in certain areas of the image. That's, that's all they do. And so it allows you to adjust for image uniformity. And so 
This is called an LGC or a linear or a lateral gain control. And so you can adjust your gain from side to side. Most machines do not have this, by the way. This is more for cardiac machines. And you, you don't see it that often anymore. Um, but this is called your DGC or your TGC. It's, it's interchangeable with depth gain control or time gain control. And it allows you to adjust gain throughout the image from top to bottom. Um, transducer frequency. Uh, when, when I started out in 86, all probes had one frequency. Um, the, the probes I was working on, they were both three and a half. There was a three and a half linear and a three and a half sector. Um, today's transducers are amazing. Um, the materials that we use, the technology that we use, um, we have these what's called broadband transducers. These transducers can scan all kinds of different frequencies, and modes. Um, they're they're amazing. And so with transducers today, it used to be when I started, some of the, some of the machines I worked on as as they evolved would have six, eight, ten, twelve transducers. On there. There'd be probes everywhere. I was a probe heaven. Um, but nowadays, one probe can do the job of many probes because of this broadband technology. And so we can have one probe. Um, for instance, that uh, we have a three point five C over there. Is that a four C? Four C. It's a four C. We have a four C transducer over there. That transducer can probably go to what two five five up there and down. Okay, so we can go from 2 megahertz, which would be useful for that 360 pound man, or 5 megahertz, which is probably more appropriate for somebody like me. So we can adjust that. The, the rule of thumb with, with frequency is you want to use the highest frequency possible for the exam that you're doing. The higher the frequency that you go, the better your resolution. That's the good news. The bad news is if you lose penetration. And so it's, it's a trade-off. It's, it's, it's simple physics. There's not a lot we can do. There's, there's some tricks where you can kind of manipulate the physics a little bit um, to get around some of these limitations. But the rule of thumb is, is that um, the higher you go in frequency, the better your image. Your image will be much prettier, um, but you are going to lose penetration. So um, if you know that, that 360 pound man, um, I'd love to use 5 megahertz on because the image is going to be pretty. But I can't because I need to penetrate, so I'm gonna have to go to the lower frequency. <coughs> so these images here. Um, how many like the top image? How many? How many like the top image? Nobody. Bottom. Cool. Right. This bottom image I use um, a higher frequency. This is a four megahertz image. Um, this is on me again. This is my diaphragm, kidney, liver. Um, you can see the dramatic differences in the images. You can see that how, how nice this texture is. This really nice ring. I didn't lose any penetration. You can see how much more defined my kidney is. And so this kind of shows you this is why you want to use higher frequencies if you can. If you can get away with it and the, patient, the patient's body allows it, use a higher frequency. Um, harmonics. Um, how many musicians in the room? Cool. So you guys know how about harmonics. Harmonics are cool. Um, what our harmonics allow us to do, this is where we start trying to play tricks on physics. And we're really not playing tricks on physics. We're kind of, we think we are, but we're not. So basically what we do is we send in a lower frequency in the body. We have our 360 pound man, and we send in two megahertz into this man's body because we need that power for penetration. Um, but every sound wave has harmonics. So if we have two megahertz, we have a harmonic of two megahertz. So we have one megahertz and four megahertz. So it's half or double that frequency. And so coming back into the machine, we have all these different frequencies. If I send in two, I'm going to get two back. But I'm also going to get four and one. I'm going to get 500 kilohertz and eight, 250 kilohertz and 16, and so on. And so what we do is we send two megahertz into the patient's body, but we filter that out. We listen for four coming. And so it gives us kind of the penetration of 2 megahertz, but kind of the resolution of 4 megahertz. So it's kind of a physics trick. And so you can see here, this is, my, um, this is my liver here, all over here, and this is my gallbladder. You can see how much cleaner the gallbladder is in that lower image because I turned on harmonics. Dynamic range. Um, dynamic range is a setting, and all these settings that we're talking about, these are present on virtually every ultrasound machine known to man. <coughs> um, these, are, these are very common settings, and that's why we're going through it, because what you may hear from a sonographer is, you know, I just don't feel like I'm getting enough dynamic range. What does that mean? Well, this is what it means. 
Dynamic range is how many shades of gray do we want to display? Um, and the answer is, well, it depends. Um, do we want to display a lot of shades of gray? Well, we want to do that for soft tissue, but we don't want to do it for other circumstances. So if you look here, this is my thyroid. And if we look at the thyroid here, and there's my common carotid again right there, my trachea. Down here, you can see the image is much softer. We're showing a lot more shades of gray. If you're looking for pathology within soft tissue, you want that dynamic range. You want to see all those soft gray. So this is the exact same image. Same patient, same image, same day, same time frame. Um, all I did was adjust my dynamic range. Now what I did is, over here. pardon me? That's what I'm doing over here. Oh, okay. That's what that's good. Focus on that. So now Ted went to a very high dynamic range. You can see all the shades of gray he's getting. And it's kind of blurry, kind of washed out. If he was doing, say, a, a breast or a thyroid or something like that, for well, um, but for a carotid, oh, um, because we're not getting that well-defined wall. Now take your dynamic range down there. We didn't need show over there again. There we go. And so you can see how the vest is planning up. So what's Ted's, what Ted's showing you is what I did here. You can see we really cleaned out the vest using a lower dynamic range here. You can also see, like right here, and you can't see it as well, this, this white line here. That one white line there is a little bit of plaque. Um, I did this about four or five years ago, I'm 53 now. Um, having that little plaque um, at uh, late 40s, Given that I was on the road for a quarter century doing service and eating burgers, that's, that's actually not bad. Yeah. Pretty, pretty darn good. So you can see this dynamic range, a low dynamic range, is much better suited for this type of exam. And we have focal and transmit zones. When we design a probe, either if we're designing it in, again, Denver, Colorado, a little, little Pittsburgh, of Boston, we make probes. Um, if we're designing a probe or the manufacturer is designing a probe, we say, okay, this particular probe, so on here, I take my, my abdominal probe. I want this abdominal probe to focus probably 12 to 14, you know, so, somewhere 12 to 14 centimeters in the body. And so the array and the lens is designed to focus that probe somewhere around 14 centimeters in the body. Well, what if I'm scanning and I see something up here and I tell the machine, I want to tell the machine, I want you to focus a little harder in this area. What we can do is, we can tell the machine, I want you to electronically focus. So the, the transducer is a fixed mechanical focus. That's the way it's built. You can't change that. Unless you do an improper repair, then you can screw it all up. But what we can do on a properly working probe is we can tell the machine, there's through various electronic wizardry in the machine called delays, where we can steer that beam and we can mold that beam, shape that beam to focus higher or lower in the image. And we do this through these things called transmit zones. Are you playing around transmit zones over there, Ted? Okay. And so there's a little transmit zone, there's a little carrot over here that just went into multiple zones. And with multiple zones, we're telling the machine, I want you to focus everywhere. Which sounds really cool, because if you focus everywhere, your image is going to be beautiful. The bad news <laughs> is, is that when you're focusing everywhere, your image slows way down. There's a there's a there's, it takes time for the sound to go in your body and out of your body. Each time we put up an additional transmit zone, we have to fire a line again. And these lines, they go really, really fast. Um, lunch is on me, if anybody knows, and Dennis, you're not allowed to answer this, or Ted. Um, lunch is on me, if anybody knows to answer this question. What is the speed of sound in the human body? 1540, you're, you're first. What's your name? And lunch, lunch is on me. Um, 15 points, very good. Let's hear it for I thought I was one of the few nerds that knew that. Um, yeah, the, the speed of sound in the human body is 1,540 meters per second. That's all I'm about. But if we're doing all these lines, we got to do it all these times. Like for this, this particular image, we have five transmit zones. So we got to fire each line five times and build that image back. And so it takes time, and the image does slow down. You can see the image is really slow here. 
What's your frame rate, Ted? Frame rate was six hertz. So we're trying, right now we're scanning at six frames per second. And then go to a single zone. 45. Now we're at 45 frames per second. So you can see how much it slows down the machine when you go to these multiple zones. So the good thing about the multiple zones, your image is beautiful, but the patient has to stay still. Uh, if they're moving around, all you're going to get is just this washed out mush. Um, and I'm using a sonographer term, it is mush. And the US stitch. Um, this artifact here, um, service engineers, how many of you have seen this type of artifact on an image? Did you try and fix it? This, this is called a stitching artifact, um, and you will get this. If you ever have somebody report to you that I have a horizontal artifact in an image, there's a 99% chance that there's nothing wrong. What happens is if you look down here, we have our transmit zones here. The machine is actually, this is where the machine is putting together those two images, and you can actually see it. And it's on every machine. And sonographers will say, no, I've never seen that before. It just popped up today, and it's broken, and I want you to fix it. You can't. It's, it's one of those things that's always there, but once it catches your eye, you can't let it go, and it will bother you forever, and you want it to go away. You can't make it go away, unless you go to a single zone. It's like we, my wife and I built a house not long ago, and we have this vaulted ceiling, and I, I painted this wall, and I missed a spot probably about this big. And we've been, we've been moved into the house for months, and she noticed it a few weeks ago, and every time she walks through that room, she's like, you got to fix that. So now, now she caught it, and now it's bothering her. And same with this. Um, if, if somebody reports to you, I have a horizontal artifact, the first thing you want to ask them is, can you turn off your multiple focal zones? And does it go away? And if it goes away, then the, the problem is not a problem. It is what it is. Um, frame rate, we just talked about it. As Ted was bringing up our multiple focal zones, our frame rate went way down. Um, frame rate is great. You want high frame rates. You don't necessarily need them. If you're looking at a stationary object with a cooperative patient, low frame rates are fine. Um, but if you're looking at a patient who's moving around, or if you're looking at the heart, um, my resting heart rate is around high 60 beats per minute. So I want a frame rate to kind of match that. If you're looking at a baby, baby's heart rates are much higher. Um, and so you want those high frame rates. So you're basically telling the machine, I want you to do the best you can with these programs. Um, space time and resolution. Um, all systems have that. Basically, because of our limitations of time, the and 1540 meters per second. Um, be, because of our limitations of time, what we can't tell the machine is, I want you to, I want you to just focus more on temporal resolution. I want more frame rate. Well, the machine can, set, can say, okay, I'm not going to fire out as many lines. So, I, so now I can do it faster. Or if you tell the machine conversely, I want to. I want the nicest image you can possibly produce. You should say, okay, but guess what? You're going to lose frame rate. I'll do it, but you're going to, you're going to lose something. Because again, you, you can't trick physics. Physics are what they are. Um, there's, there's ways to do it, and there's technologies that um, are playing around with, uh, with circumventing some of the laws of physics, but they're not going to really do it. They're just finding ways to take it down. <coughs> Um, edge and pre-processing. We all have big screen TVs in our house today. Um, very few people have two TVs. Um, we, when we get big screen TVs at home, most of us are tech people, so we're going to we'll start playing with the settings. You know, I want to change the color and the brightness and the sharpness and the contrast and so on. Um, edge and pre-processing, all that is, is you're changing the sharpness of your image. How sharp do you want this image? Um, what I did was, I took my edge, and I went with maximum and minimum. You can see our maximum is very, very sharp. Our minimum is very soft and washed out. Um, so I can tell the machine, and Ted's demonstrating that up here, I can tell the machine how sharp I want that image. I always leave it somewhere in between, um, but it, it, it's subjective. It's, it's what you want. Um, I, I find the, the, the really, really sharp images a little abrasive. Um, persistence or frame averaging, when you look at an ultrasound image, you are not looking at a single frame, ever. Um, at least that, that I know of. You're looking at an average of multiple frames. If you were looking at a single frame, it would be very, very noisy. And so 
What the machine does is it averages. It takes two or three um, images or frames and overlays them and then averages them, averages them out and gives you a nice smooth image. Um, are you on persistence number? Yeah. Fred? Okay. Yeah. I mix up frame and Ted. Super high, uh, it's the highest frame averaging. So the long and short of it is, and the reason we're going through this is because you are going to hear these terms if you get in front of a sonographer. Um, I, I strongly encourage you to, when you get in front of a machine, lift up your shirt or pull down your collar or scan it. Um, these, things, these things are cool, they're wonderful, and they're harmless. Um, and uh, you can't break it. Um, I mean, you, you, it, it, well, don't, don't drop the probe. And if you do, send it to us. <laughs> but you, you really can't break these machines. Um, you know, the, the only time, it, it, don't start messing around with the software, don't start going deep into the software, and if you get the dialog box that says, are you sure you want to do this, think twice. Um, but other than that, you really can't. So, post-processing and gray map. Um, we talked earlier when I was talking about B-mode, how we send lines of, in, or lines of ultrasound into the body, and we receive the echoes back, and we assign a shade of gray to that. Well, I can tell the machine, uh, I want you to balance those shades of gray. I want an even map. Um, or I can say, I want you to accentuate the whites, or the, you know, the bright echoes or the dark echoes more. And so all I did here was I just made adjustments in what's called post-processing. I just changed my map. I said, you know what, I want you to present the image to me a little bit different. And this is called post-processing. Um, you can also do it with color. Over here, I, I, I um, sent some images in, in color. Um, Color is mainly, the, the colorized image is mainly used in uh, pulse wave Doppler. Because of the way the human eye is designed, we can sense changes in colors a little bit better than we can change or sense changes in shades of gray. And so sometimes we will colorize the image. If there's something really that I, I think I see something, I'm not sure, you turn on, you, you colorize the image, and you, you may be able to catch it. It's extremely subtle. It's kind of more of a gimmick. It's just kind of I think it's being color and G, isn't it? Colorize. Colorize. Well, and that's the thing. Isha brought up a good point. Is Accusine called it B color? What do they call it? All these terms that we're talking about, all the machines have them. It's, you know, I, I'm a car guy and I like to draw car analogies. Every car has an engine, it has a transmission, it has an electrical system, and so on. Um, all ultrasound machines, they have to do the same. That that's the way they work. I mean, there's there's variations in different terminology, and a company will come out with something, and they'll they'll brand it differently. Um, and we'll get into something in a moment that's a perfect example. But it's similar technology; they just they call it. Um, speckle reduction imaging. Um, this has been out for I don't know, ten years or so. Um, and basically, what it does, it gets rid of speckle. Um, in ultrasound images, they're speckly. Um, personally, I like speckle. I like contrast images. That's just me because I'm old and I've been doing this a long time. And I like them in a certain way. This new technology, it's newfangled. I don't need it. Um, I like the old stuff. But there, there is a there is a clinical value to it. And so if you look at these, this is not me. Um, I sold these off the internet. Did not pay for the license for anybody. Uh, and so you can see this image here. It is clearer uh, than this image up here because we turn we turn speckle reduction imaging. This is really cool. This is where we get into, all the manufacturers have it, but they like to call it different things um, because they want to keep it their own, as ours is better than yours. Um, this is called compound imaging. Um, we talked about traditional conventional ultrasound where we send lines in the body, we send them down um, parallel to the face of the probe, and we receive them back. <coughs> That's conventional ultrasound. With compound imaging over here, Ted, does that, does that machine have compound? Do you, um, do you have a corner of paper because of can you, can you do an air fire and see if you can show that? Putting the, the uh, lens off. And I think we can demonstrate this here. But basically, what we do with compound imaging is we fire the lines down, straight down, like we do conventionally. Okay, so that's conventional. You can see Ted is, he's, he has a metallic object, not a sharp one, because we well, sharp objects are transition lenses. Um, but he's got a metallic object, and he's creating this bright reflector across the face of the image. You can see it right there. So we're sending a single line down, getting it back. Now go ahead and turn on compound. 
There we go. You see, it's, now we have a line here, a line here, and a line here. So we're sending the beam out at different angles. And what it does is it allows us, if we have an object that is irregularly shaped, like this mass here, it allows us to get a better representation. Kind of a CT, that's why CTs, you know, they go in circles. They, they want to hit you from all different angles. That's why CT is, the images are so lovely, because it's hitting you from a 360 degree. We can't do 360 degrees, but we can start changing some of the angles of how we fire these, um, these lines. And you can see here, here's the mass here. Again, this is not me, no pathology here, I'm here on man. Um, stole another one off the internet. And so you can see this mass up here. Yeah, I can see it. But down here, look at how well it stands out because we use compound. All right, troubleshooting artifacts. Um, this goes back to my service engineer days. Um, most artifacts um, are typically hypoechoic rather than hyperechoic, which means um, they're dark. And that's typically indicative of either an anomaly or damage within the array of the transducer, or the cable of the transducer, or we can get down into the machine. And so if we do have an artifact like this, I went to this customer site when I was building this presentation, and they had a bad probe. I'm like, oh, this is great. A, it's because I can use this for my presentation. B is, I'm going to sell you a probe today. <laughs> and so you can see this artifact right here, right in the middle. And so this, this particular artifact happened to be um, a bad element in a transducer array. Um, but what if I had another transducer and I brought it over and it's still there? Well, now it's not broken. Now we may have something within the machine. Um, but the other thing I did is when I saw that, then I started flexing the cable. Because sometimes if you look at these transducer cables, you know, we have the, the, the main cable going into what's called the strain relief, and then the strain relief goes into the scan head. Well, a sonographer, they're scanning like this all day, and they're doing this. And so we're flexing this probe right at this point. Um, these internal cables, they start to break. Um, as I mentioned, we build cables um, for transducers, and we actually have a device, uh, it's a mechanical device, that manipulates transducer cables so we can test our, our materials. And what it does is it toggles the transducer back and forth 180 degrees, and it torques it 90 degrees on each cycle. And we, we have a counter on it, and it counts how many cycles our cables and our strain reliefs can handle before they start breaking. And that's how we know how good our cables are. Well, these cables, they get stressed every day, all day, doing basically the same thing. So we just simulate that with the machine. And so cables start breaking within the neck of the transducer. Right? It's the nature of the beast. Um, it, it is what it is. They break, and they will break over time. And so you can take that cable and start flexing it a little bit and see if that makes the artifact get better or worse. If it does, then you know you have a bad case. Um, pins and connector. Inspect pins regularly, especially you students, because students are notoriously rough on machines. Um, if you, <laughs> and each is like, yes, they are. <laughs> um, if, you have, if you have pinned transducers, and the majority of the transducers out there are still pinned, check your pins on a regular basis. Because here's what happens, is you get a bent pin on a probe, and then the sonographer is going to plug that bent pin into a machine. It's not going to want to go in, so he or she is going to say, well, I'm just going to push on the part. And then they're going to crank it down and lock it in. So now that bent pin just broke a pin on the interface board of that machine. So now we have two problems. We have a probe problem, and we have a machine problem. Then it gets worse. Then they unplug that probe, and then they plug another probe into that slot. So the bent pin on the slot now damages another probe. And then that probe goes across the hall, and it affects another one. So it's like a virus. It gets worse and worse. It never gets better. If you have a bent pin on your machine or on your probe, get it out of there. Get it out of there immediately because you will start causing more and more um, Again, the connector board. Inspect it regularly. If you inspect the pins and you inspect the cable and you inspect the array and so on and everything's cool, and you still have an artifact, now you're inside the machine. Uh, there's something going on with the front end board or the beam former inside that focus. Image noise. Um, this was my favorite. When I was a service engineer, I was a, my specialty was troubleshooting noise. I used to go all over the country figuring out noise problems. Noise, I was like a ghost buster because noise problems are ghosts. They, they come from anywhere. Fluorescent lights, fans, gel bottles, uh, you name it. I, I had one at a hospital. Um, there, they had this intermittent noise problem. It was actually coming from a treadmill that was like four rooms down. And every time that treadmill came on, there was all this noise in the machine. 
Um, I had one at, uh, it was at the University of California, San Francisco many years ago, I'll never forget this. Um, intermittent noise problem, drove from nuts, we replaced everything, including the machine, and even the new machine, noise problem. And I was there late, late one night working on it, and uh, as I saw the noise come up on the machine, I heard something in the background, it was the elevator passing the floor. Every time the elevator passed the floor, there's my noise. Um, I had another situation where I had a noise problem, and it was, a, it was a small doctor's office, and I replaced everything on this machine but the wheels. I could not figure it out. I ended up grounding the machine with jumper cables through a cold water pipe in the room, and the noise went away. Okay, I had a ground problem. And I went out, I went home, and he was around the corner from my house, and I got a garden hose, and I dripped the garden hose on the building ground uh, for a couple of days, and the noise went away. So I had a bad building. These noise problems can come from um, the room. Yeah, they're very fixed, but they're fun. I, again, I'm a nerd, and so I love that stuff. So with noise problems, the, the sources can vary. It can be coming in through the power cable. It can, come in through, it can be coming in through the air. It could be EMI or RF, electromagnetic interference or radio frequency interference. It can come from anywhere. Hey, Matt, there's a guy with a probe above the projector. Oh, yeah. And we get noise. Yeah. 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 Nice. Yeah. So, so Ted is Ted is picking up noise from our projector. Um, ultrasound machines for the probes, they're, they're shielded very well. Um, the, the cables themselves have shielding. Some of the transducers, the nose piece has shielding. But at the end of the day, it's a giant antenna. Um, it will pick up noise from the air. And so, what you want to do is, if you get noise, check the probe, check the cable. Again, you can do a wiggle on the cable. Um, can you isolate the system? This isn't relevant so much today. Um, back when I started, there was all these devices connected to the machine. There was cameras and VCRs and black and white printers and so on, and you'd unplug everything. Nowadays, you just have a network cable. You have an external monitor, so unplug everything from the machine and see if anything is injecting noise into the machine. Um, different power source. It may be coming in through the power source. Can you try a different circuit? Will a different circuit fix that problem? If it's environmental, move the machine to a different environment. Try that. So if you're in a hospital and you have a problem, you have a problem in radiology where a machine has this noise issue, take that machine, bring it down to your shop, or even bring it around the corner in the hall and plug it somewhere else. See if the noise goes away. Now you know the noise is external rather than internal. Um, system grounds are they intact internally or externally? Um, how many still have logic nines? Um, our, our UHS friends are back there. There's still a couple logic nines. You have sex? You guys have not? Oh, there <laughs> So, you guys ever get that, that noise with the card cage? Yeah, um, there, there's a, a noise problem where the card cage on the Logic 9, um, I used to do tech support on that, and people would call me with this kind of noise. It's ex exactly that right there. And the card cage cover um, would oxidize. And the solution is, well, there's, a, there's a much more refined solution, but what I would tell people is, take your fist and punch the right side pad, and it will fix the problem. And it would look at it. It was like, it's just try it. Just pop it. And it would fix it. And all you're doing is you're jarring that cartridge cage cover a little bit and, and reestablishing that ground plane. The, the right fix was to take it off and take the screws off and take it out. But it's just cool. It fixes it. It just looked really awesome. Um, and then is the facility ground compromised? Is there something wrong with the facility ground? And that it is possible. And that's it. I think we're like three minutes under time. I'm exhausted. How about you guys? Okay, any questions? Um, we, we, normally, this takes a couple hours, so we kind of compressed it. Um, does anybody have any questions? If you scan dry, um, the, the gel is um, for acoustic coupling. Um, if you do not use gel, you are not going to get rid of it. You have to have gel to couple the mechanical waste. Any other questions? Okay, I'm going to ask you all um, if you can make sure you sign the sign in sheet. Um, there's surveys on the class, to be honest. Um, you can't hurt my feelings. And I also have, um, I have a bunch of business cards up there. If any of you want this presentation or anything else ultrasound related, grab one of my business cards and email me. Um, my cell phone number is on there also. Um, so feel free to call me. I got a stack of them right here. And thank you. Appreciate you coming. What are they doing?